The chainsaw, the one essential piece of gear, whether you're doing arborist work, logging, cutting logs for your sawmill, milling beams, building a log cabin, or just cutting up a year's supply of firewood. In this video, we're going to take a deep dive look at all the aspects of a chainsaw, how to operate it, how to maintain it, how to clean it up, how to keep it sharp, how to make cuts, what to watch out for, and how to operate a saw safely with essential gear and common sense. My name's Dave Whipple, and you're watching Bush Radical. When it comes to everything chainsaw, I can't think of another subject that has so many strong opinions. Everything I'm about to cover in this video is probably going to be disputed by somebody else. That being said, let's dive right in. Now any modern chainsaw is gonna have three controls. An on-off switch, choke control for cold starts, and a throttle lever. This throttle lever also has a throttle lock, so you can't pull the throttle unless your hand is actually wrapped around. All modern chainsaws are also gonna have three safety features. A chain brake, a chain catcher, and a spark arrestor inside the muffler. The chain brake is this metal band. It goes all the way around your centrifugal clutch housing. So when the brake is tripped, that steel band grabs a hold of the centrifugal clutch housing and locks it in place. In the event of a kickback, the chain brake is gonna be activated by the chain brake lever making contact with your wrist. And the steel band that is the chain brake is gonna lock down the centrifugal clutch, stopping the chain. You just pull the handle back to reset the brake mechanisms. The lever's activated by your wrist, so if your hand is out of position, the lever won't contact your wrist and it won't stop the chain. Keep your hand in position. On this particular saw, this is where you adjust the tension on the chain. Turning it clockwise tightens the chain, turning it counterclockwise loosens the chain. There's a hole in the bar. The adjuster has a pin that sits in that hole and it will pull the bar back or push the bar forward, either loosening the chain or tightening it. Now if the chain becomes too loose, it will jump off of the bar. Now, in the event the chain does jump off, this chain's gonna be spinning at a thousand miles an hour. This chain catcher, its whole job is to stop that chain's momentum and stop that chain's inertia. Without that chain catcher, this chain could be right back here by your right hand, spinning around a thousand miles an hour. It's the job of the chain catcher to stop that chain moving. Also, this extended base plate is supposed to provide you some protection from that chain coming up into the area of your right hand. Now the chain brake is a safety feature for kickback. The chain catcher and the base plate of the saw keep a derailed chain from getting back in the area by your hands while spinning. The muffler screen is a spark arrestor. It keeps little hot bits of carbon from your combustion chamber from spitting out of the muffler and starting a fire. Safety for your face and body, safety for your right hand and right arm, safety for the woods. When you're tightening up the chain on a saw, push down the tip. That'll put the saw into the same kind of tension that it would have if it's cutting through a log. Now as far as chain tension goes, you get it too tight, you're gonna wear your bar and stretch your chain. Too loose, you're asking for it to fall right off. That's about right. When you put your side cover back on, make sure that the keeper nuts are good and snug. Now these things don't have to be torqued super hard, they just need to be snug. What they can't be is forgotten about. Retighten your nuts, make sure they're even, and get them snug. Chainsaw bars need to be removed from the saw at times and flipped over to ensure even wear. How often? Ask a thousand people, you'll get a thousand different answers. Every chainsaw bar that I know of has a bar sprocket on the end. Some bar sprockets are greasable and have a hole for grease, some don't. If your bar sprocket is the greasable kind, clean out the sand and debris with compressed air, then grease it up. You go to the hardware store and get yourself one of these little grease tools, put it in the hole, and you give her a few pumps. Don't forget to do the hole on the other side. How much grease? Well, you're definitely not gonna hurt it by putting too much in. Now an old friend of ours, Neil Eklund, he was a highline logger in Sitka, Alaska back in the 80s. He gave me one of the best pieces of advice there is. Stay out of the plane of the saw. Now here's a good visual aid. Just a chunk of cardboard zip tied to the bar. If you're right here, you're in the plane of the saw. If you're out here, you're out of the plane of the saw. Right here, a kickback will come right up at you. The center line of that bar is right in the middle of my nose. If there is a kickback, and if my hand is too far to the outside, which it should never be, that's where that bar's going. Just by the simple act of body placement, you can mitigate kickback danger a bit. For example, here my head's right in the plane of the saw, and now it's not. For safety gear, let's start with a good heavy pair of leather boots. Not only is the leather going to help protect your feet from the accidental cut, but it's also important to have really good footing when you're running a chainsaw. 
You're also going to need a good set of earmuffs or a set of earplugs at the very least. If you store your earmuffs in the garage on a nail like I do, it's important to check them for spiders and spider webs. Ask me how I know. And of course you're going to need eye protection and a good pair of leather gloves. Gloves, boots, eye and ear protection. That's essential safety gear. What about Kevlar chaps, face shields, hard hats, goggles? When it comes to safety gear, buy every single piece of safety gear that you feel that you need. But never let it give you the false sense of security that because you have it, you can't be injured by the saw. All that stuff is fine, but none of it can take the place of common sense. Common sense is gonna be your best piece of safety gear no matter what. If you have every piece of safety gear and it makes you feel complacent, then the safety gear is not benefiting you as much as it could. You can still cut below the Kevlar chaps. You can still cut across the top of your foot. You can still have a kickback. Safety gear does not replace caution and common sense. A hard hat is not gonna protect you if you have a thousand pound dead branch in a tree that you're trying to fell and it lands on you. It's just gonna be a side note in the autopsy. Same thing can be said about gravity. Ladders and chainsaws don't mix. If you don't have any experience as an arborist and you're 30 feet up an extension ladder cutting a branch and you're really not sure what's gonna happen, you're gonna die sooner or later. Ladders suck by themselves. Start running a chainsaw on them and then add the element of wood that is about to come falling down. It's a bad deal. The internet is absolutely full of homeowner videos where somebody tried to cut some part of a tree off a ladder and wrecked themselves. Same thing could be said about kinetic energy. You got a hard hat and goggles and gauntlets and chaps and steel toed boots and, and a fall heart, whatever and you're cutting a treetop that is twisted and bound and has a lot of stored energy and you cut the wrong limb and you take a coffee can sized limb right across the chest, none of that stuff is gonna help you. No matter what you're wearing, no matter how much Kevlar, face protection or hearing protection, none of that stuff is gonna save you from kinetic energy. Well, let's talk about sharpening a chainsaw. First of all, you're going to want to make that saw stationary and immobile and stable, whether that's in the garage or with a little stump place like this out in the woods. You can sharpen a saw without it being locked in place, but having it immobile is going to make it much easier. You're going to get a better result. Now, the first thing I do when sharpening a chain is I like to touch up the raker. This section of the chain that looks like a little shark fin is the raker or depth gauge. It's going to determine how deep the tooth will cut. Now, I don't file down the rakers every time, only about once in every four or five sharpenings. I like to take the handle of the file or a little chunk of wood and set it right over top of the tooth. What this does keeps my raker file from sliding off of the raker into the face of the tooth and marring up the tooth. What I'm generally looking for is I want to see the same amount of flat on top of this raker from one raker to the next. So I try to keep the file as flat as possible so it's not rocked up one way or the other. I will cover up the cutting tooth. I'll make a couple passes on that raker. I move down to the next one. I want about that same amount. Now, of course, the more I sharpen this chain, the more I will be sending this cutting edge farther back. The teeth are not flat. They actually have a little bit of rise to the front end. The farther back you sharpen this, the lower that contact point is going to be. Each time you sharpen your chain, you're lowering this point a little bit at a time and you're going to want to take your raker down just to fuzz to compensate for that. From the cutting edge of the tooth to the top of the raker it's going to be grabbing about that much wood. Now how far down do you want to take your raker? If you're cutting soft wood you can take it down farther and it'll pull bigger chunks out. If you're cutting hardwood maybe not so far as it's going to be a lot harder on your saw. With a really aggressive chain it's going to stress the motor a little bit more. So take the rakers down according to what wood you're cutting. You can see there's a flat spot on top of the raker. I'm judging that by eye, but it's always worked well for me. This only takes a minute. You can get a good rhythm going. Now, of course, they make a jig for doing this, so you don't have to guess. But I generally just tend to do it this way. Now, each tooth has a line that shows you the correct angle to set your file at. Just stick with that line. Set the chain brake. Now, if you have a little vise like this, use two hands. It'll go quicker. You'll be able to keep a more consistent angle. Once you get all the teeth, rotate the chain. Now the number of passes you make with the file doesn't really make any difference. Some teeth need one stroke, some teeth might need four or five strokes. Just get the tooth sharp. You want the underside of this leading edge to be nice and sharp. And most important, you want this tip, this corner right here, to be free of any dings or defections or roll over or anything. You want to clean that tooth up 
can tell that's a nice true sharp corner. Sometimes when you're passing your file through, a little bit of upward pull can help. Cutting edge of that tooth looks like a cresting wave and the file sits in here like this. Sometimes a little bit of upward pull will help it reach that very cutting edge and clean the corner of the tooth up. If you put too much downward pressure, you could cut into the gullet and never actually clean up the cutting edge up here at the point. You don't really have this issue with the correct size file, but if you have several different sizes of chainsaws like I do, sooner or later you're likely to find yourself out in the woods with a file that is a size smaller than what you want. But you can still get your chain sharp with that file with just a little bit of upward pull. Always set your saw up in the vise so you feel the most comfortable filing with your dominant hand. If you're right-handed, it's going to be difficult to do the same quality of job using your left hand. The file is likely to wander around and you're going to have a harder time keeping the angle right. Just set it up so you can file with your dominant hand. And before you know it, we're all the way back around all the teeth. Now this is a file called a steel 2-in-1 and it works fantastic. It has both round files and flat files and a rail system. It sharpens the tooth, takes the rakers down, and it's precise. It works perfectly. The only problem is it's not the right size for this particular saw. It's for my bigger saw. But generally if I'm out in the woods I just carry a small flat file. I carry a round file that's the right size for the saw I'm using and that's about it. Ear protection, eye protection, a good heavy set of leather gloves, and a good heavy set of leather boots. Let's cut some wood. Now when you start a chainsaw, you can stick the handle between your legs and pull the pull rope. You can set the saw on the ground and try to fit your toe in on that bottom plate of the saw and start it that way. A lot of folks will drop start a chainsaw using the weight of the saw and dropping the saw away as you pull the cord. I'm not going to tell you which one is right. Do whatever feels the safest to you. As your saw is warming up, it's a good time to take your tools and find some place to put them where you're not going to lose them. Now there's three basics everybody needs to understand. When you're making a cut and you're using the bottom of the bar, the chain is pulling the saw into the work. When you're cutting from underneath and using the top of the bar, the chain is pushing the saw away from the work back towards you and you have to resist that motion. Cutting from underneath is also where you're most likely to run into a kickback. When the tip of the bar is the only thing that's making contact with your wood, it is going to want to run up the face of the wood. The bottom of the bar pulls the saw into the work, the top of the bar is always pushing the saw away from the work, and the tip, when you're cutting right with the tip, it always wants to lift that saw. That's what kickback is all about. So the cut you use is really simple. If your log is suspended between two points and there's nothing holding it up in the middle, it's going to drop in the middle. So in this instance, you would make cuts from the bottom or you would use top cuts and as soon as you see the gap start to close, you would stop if you can roll the log and finish the cut from the other side. If, however, a tree is suspended by one end and all the weight is up in the air, you'd use top cuts and just take it off piece by piece. What you're trying to do is avoid pinching the saw. A cut like this, this is obviously a cut that needs to be made from above. Here you have a branch that's suspended and it's just held in place by the one end where it's connected to the main branch of this top. I can just cut each piece off with a top cut. Gravity is going to open the kerf and the piece is going to fall off. Here's an example where a log is suspended in the middle and making contact on each end. It's going to drop when it's cut so I'm going to use an undercut. But whether you use a top cut or a bottom cut, the thing that matters is you want to use the cut that doesn't pinch the bar in the work. Once in a while you're going to find yourself in a situation where it's a little difficult to judge which cut to make. If you're cutting up a treetop that is very busy and has a lot of branches, or if you're working in an area where a storm has blown down a group of trees, it may be difficult to tell where the forces are actually being applied and if a cut is going to open or close. In a situation like that, you need to read the kerf. The kerf that the saw leaves is going to close or it's going to open the farther the saw gets through the work, and it will tell you if you're making the right cut or not. If you see the curve starting to close, stop and remove the chainsaw. Another good thing to remember is to match the saw to the work you're likely to do. You don't want to try to cut a year's worth of firewood with a 20cc saw, and it doesn't make any sense to trim fruit trees with a 60cc saw. If you're going to spend money and buy one good saw, I would get a saw that matches the biggest work that you're likely to do the most often. If you're only going to cut up a branch or two a year, I would get an electric chainsaw. It's always a good idea to cut sections of a log almost all the way through. As long as you can roll the log, then you can finish the cut on the other side and keep the chain out of the dirt. Now knowing which side of the log to cut on is important, but there is one more thing to consider that's more important. 
When you're cutting up a tree that you have fallen or that has blown down in a storm, the thing you really need to watch out for is stored tension. You just think of like pulling a bow back, you know, if the limbs, they're under a whole lot of tension. When a tree falls in the woods, a lot of times the canopy of the tree can get wedged in between other trees and it'll make a lot of the branches in the tree under tension like the limbs of a bow. You cut one of those and it may come back and just nail you. Stored energy in limbs that are under tension that's something you really gotta watch for. Here's a small example of what I mean. This limb is bent. This tree is holding tension on this limb. If I was to make a cut right here on this side of the tree, this whole section may come back a foot, two feet, and catch me right across the shins. Years ago, I was cutting up the top of a beech tree that had fallen over, and I run into this one limb that was the size of a small coffee can, and when I got to the end of the cut, that limb moved about that far and it stopped about this far from my thighs and it did it in an absolute instant. It was bang, just like that. If I'd have been just a little bit farther forward, I would have caught that branch right across the thighs and it would have felt like getting hit by a car. It had a whole lot of energy pulling it back and when I finished that cut, boom, it jumped right at me. And I was looking for stored tension. I was paying attention to the tree. Sometimes the top of a tree can be so busy and there's so many branches you really don't know what ones are being pulled back under tension and what ones are just hanging out there loose. You can't be too careful. Now this branch is just a Mickey Mouse example of stored tension, but it serves to illustrate the concept. A small light chainsaw with a short bar is handy to have in a busy setting like cutting up this treetop. But even with a small light saw, you still have to keep all the safety points in mind. Where's the tip of the bar? Which way is the cut gonna open? Is there stored tension? Is my face and most of my body outside of the plane of the bar? You also want to watch for logs rolling. As soon as I cut her loose here, this log is going to roll. It's just got a big heavy butt end that's up in the air down here, and it's two or three feet off the ground in the middle. There's no question that's going to roll. You're back here making the cut at the top. The rolling of it is not going to be that big of a deal, but if it still had another branch that's up overhead and you cut it loose, that branch could roll down and just give you the, give you the giant hand on the head treatment. Experience is what you need so you can make the best decisions. And while you're getting that experience, caution is your best friend. I mentioned safety gear before, chaps and a hard hat and a face shield. None of that stuff is going to protect you from a, a branch this big around that's under a lot of tension being cut in the wrong way and hitting you. Honestly, there's a million ways to get hurt, felling a tree or cutting up a treetop. You just want to mitigate them the most you can. Watch for stored tension, watch for which way a branch or a log is gonna roll when you start freeing up the top and stay out of the plane of the bar. Now I'm a firewood guy and I build log cabins. That's my experience. I'm not a professional logger or an arborist. And like anything when it comes to chainsaws, somebody's gonna tell me I'm wrong. Diligence and good judgment are your best pieces of safety equipment. Now let's talk about chainsaw maintenance. Chainsaws get filthy. You're getting fuel spilled on them. They're constantly oiling themselves. The oil is flinging off. There's sawdust. You're cutting down into the dirt sometimes when you don't intend to. There's dust and sun and wind and rain and chainsaws take a lot of abuse. Now the best thing you can do is stay up on maintenance and keep your saws clean after every use, but that's not always possible and it's really probably not gonna happen. So when you get a saw that's really filthy like this, it's best to take a little bit of time and go give it a thorough cleaning. And take a saw that looks like this and make it look like this. So what's the first thing you need to grab if you want to get a saw like this that's been neglected, cleaned right up? Grab a jug of vinegar and then cut the top off it. We're going to dump the gas out of this thing. Any saw that's been sitting for a while, the first thing it needs to do is to get rid of the old gas. Not only is it good to get rid of the old gas, it's good to flush out any dust and particles and chips of wood or anything that's migrated into the gasoline tank. Chainsaws should always be run on non-ethanol fuel, and generally non-ethanol fuel lasts quite a long time. But putting fresh fuel in an old saw and cleaning out the tank is never the wrong thing to do. It also gives you an opportunity to look at the fuel filter inside the tank, and just to get all that crud out of the bottom. Another reason to dump the tank and put in fresh fuel, you want to make sure the saw runs properly before you clean it. If it's sat for a long time, well, maybe there's other issues. You need to know you have a good functioning saw before you spend any time and effort getting it clean. Make sure the saw starts up like it should, that it idles smoothly, that it revs up and responds correctly. Then you know you've got a good functioning saw and you can move on. Now it's time to grab yourself some rubber gloves, chuck in some earplugs and plug in your air compressor and compressed air is loud. 
Everything on a chainsaw is greasy and dusty and dirty. It's nice just to keep it off your hands if you can. If you've ever watched a video on the internet about detailing cars, you find it's fascinating. People will take a filthy car and they'll clean the carpets and steam clean the upholstery and pretty soon it looks pretty nice. It's kind of the same thing cleaning a chainsaw with air. You get a whole lot of instant gratification from seeing just big chunks of grease and grime and oil and sawdust just go flying off and your saw starts to look like it did when you bought it. Now is a clean chainsaw essential? Not really. A dirty chainsaw can cut just as well as a clean one. But a good quality tool that can last a long time, well it deserves to be taken care of. I've had this particular saw for over a decade. Now I don't want any sawdust in the engine and I have to blow off this whole area so we're going to do the air filter last. Now this particular chainsaw is an 034 steel. I've had it for a long time. They quit making this model I believe in 1994 so it's at least almost a 30 year old chainsaw. That shows how long they can last and this thing has cut dozens of cords of firewood. What brand of chainsaw you should buy is basically like that Ford Chevy Dodge conversation you've heard your whole life. Get a good brand, a Husky, an Echo, a Steel, a Shindawa. Buy the brand of saw with the easiest to get parts and the closest dealer to where you live. Now I know the saw runs good, but if it didn't, one of the first places you'd want to check is this rubber boot right here. This is the intake boot. It connects the carburetor into the head and it's rubber and flexible to take all the vibrations, but sometimes these things will dry rot. Another common failure point is the fuel line, especially in a steel. Over the years I've seen a lot of these fail from dry rot. They'll get small cracks, a lot of times right here in the bend, and they'll start sucking in air. Now this is the engine's flywheel, and I'm not going to do too much blowing right in this area because I don't want to get anything back in behind there. Now you could take off the side plate that holds the bar on, but that really doesn't make any difference. That's, that's the dirtiest place in the saw. As soon as you use it for one minute, it'll be just as filthy as it ever was. It really doesn't make any sense to take that cover off. Everything else, get it as clean as you can. Now what you want to do is you want to get the saw as free of exterior debris as possible. Then we can move on to the air filter. And the air filter is something that actually does matter. You can have a dirty saw on the outside and that really doesn't matter. But when your air filter is dirty, it's restricting the amount of air that the saw can take in. Just like putting a towel over your face and trying to breathe. What it does is it makes the mixture of air and fuel much richer. It's still getting fuel, but it's starving for air. Put a finger over the main passage of the carburetor and then feel free to blow off the rest of whatever's on the outside. Now take a look at this air filter. This filter, it doesn't look horrible, but it is actually quite plugged up. There's also some fine dust on the inside. It probably made its way in at the seal between the two halves, but I'm going to inspect it for holes. Now you're not going to want to hit this filter with the same amount of compressed air that you would use to blow off the saw. Only give it about half throttle. What you don't want to do is you don't want to tear out the fibers in the actual filter element itself. Go real light with as little amount of pressure as can get the job done, always working from the inside of the filter outward. No matter what kind of filter it is, you could do this with any kind of filter, but don't blow from the outside in and pack sawdust and dirt into the fibers of the filter. Go from the inside and blow it out. Now the more careful you are and the more you control the, the blast of air coming out of the air check, the longer the filter is going to last, the more times you can clean it the, the longer you're going to get a useful life out of it. So just take your time, slowly work it off, and eventually it's going to end up being a clean filter again. Now the air filter element is the one part on the saw that can really affect the way it performs, that anybody can take off the saw and clean and put back on. You don't need a degree. It's very simple, very straightforward to go from this to that. Now I mentioned earlier it doesn't make much sense to clean under this cover, but you might as well air check it out while you're at it. Now that the saw's been blown free of debris and the air filter's been cleaned up, I'm going to see if there's anything I can do with this oxidized plastic. If you look over this saw, you can see it's made of about three or four different kinds of plastic. Some of them really look like they oxidize quite easily, and other ones, nothing seems to bother them. I'm going to clean up some of these parts. Maybe we'll put some wax on them and see if we can at least make an improvement in the appearance. 
I want to take some real light duty wet dry 1500 grit sandpaper and just try to buff out some of the oxidization that makes it gives it that white powdery look. Do I know what I'm doing? No. Does any of this matter? No. But you know when you got an old saw that couldn't look much worse you might as well give it a little bit of attention and see if you can bring it back around. The saw functions well, the saw has clean gas, and the saw just had its air filter cleaned out, so it's about as good as it's ever going to get. But taking a little bit of an extra minute or two, 20 minutes, and getting the saw to look the best it can, it's not going to make it run any better. It's not going to make it run any worse. I suppose one benefit from cleaning up a saw like this is the next time I'm done using it, I'll probably be more likely to give it a second and air check it off and, and keep it looking good as opposed to just letting 10 years of use and abuse pile up on it. Now this saw being a 30 year old chainsaw and me having it 10 years, it was at least 20 years old when I bought it. And it's been about as reliable as any saw you could ever hope to buy. I'd like to cut firewood with this saw for the foreseeable future. It's just ergonomic, it's got a lot of power, it's not that heavy, but it's seen a whole lot. I think I'm gonna finish it off with a little wax. Is it the right thing to use? Man, who knows? I don't know. Who waxes the chainsaw? I just like to take enough time to get it cleaned up as good as it can be cleaned up, get it sharpened, fresh gas, fresh oil, cleaned out filter, and it'll be ready for another year of cotton firewood. Now I'm gonna leave the handle alone because I don't want anything on the handle. In just a short amount of time, you can take a chainsaw that looked like this and make it look like this. It won't make the saw any younger or any less wore out. It won't make it run any better or cut any faster, but it will make it nicer to use. It'll make it last longer and it'll make it easier to repair in the event you have to take it apart and change something. So there you go. That's everything I know about chainsaws in a nutshell. How to sharpen them, how to take down the rakers, how to keep the bar in good shape, how to keep the bar sprocket lubricated, how to keep the air filter cleaned out, how to clean up a neglected saw, how to be safe in the woods through common sense with minimal but essential gear for safety. The one thing I will guarantee you, everything I said, somebody's gonna tell me I did it wrong. Chainsaws by nature are a very dangerous tool and because of that, the people who run chainsaws have very strong opinions of what is the right way to do everything under the sun in the world of using a chainsaw. Once again, when it comes to safety gear, buy every single piece of safety gear that you feel that you need, but never let it give you the false sense of security that because you have it, you can't be injured. Caution is your best piece of safety equipment no matter what. Hope you guys have found this really useful, especially if you're new to chainsaw and you wanted a rundown of the do's and don'ts and how to maintain a saw. I hope this has been what you were looking for. My name's Dave Whipple and you've been watching Bush Radical. Be radical, eh? See you soon. Mm -hmm.